Welcome back to Rural Water Resource Management Week 1, Lecture 5. This is the last lecture for the first week. And normally what I would prefer is to go back through the week's course lecture notes and then reiterate how they combine together for every week. So that would actually put you in the right track to understand why we went through these different lectures, all the four lectures for this week. Uh, and then how it all gels together for the common interest, which is rural water resource management. Uh, let's do the recap of week one. What did we see? Um, and this is a small example, the image I show here. Uh, what you see here is a lot of farm ponds or rural water resource management uh, in Maharashtra region, um, right next to uh, Mumbai on the outside. And uh, you could see that a lot of land has been um, used uh, to segregate water, to store the water, and then use it for agricultural purposes. Because for drinking, you don't need this many number of tanks. So uh, what did we see? First, we introduced the course content. Uh, what is uh, rural water resource management? We looked into concepts of differences between urban water resource management and the rural. And we focused more our discussions on the rural aspect. Then we looked into the hydrological cycle, uh, where the water is available, how much water is available. I'll go again one more time uh, today, because now after going through the hydrological cycle, the different compartments of water, you would be in a better position to now relate back to the availability of water. Okay, so, uh, That actually drives the drives the force on why we need to learn and focus on water management for rural regions, right? Then we used a lot of units and quantification of water. We looked at different units, how they should be used to quantify water. Uh, and uh, we also looked at uh, footprints. We looked at water stress indicators. Uh, we saw how and why a particular uh, region in the world is going to be water stressed, especially Indian regions. And within Indian regions, a lot of rural regions are going to be water stressed by 2030. Um, we looked at what are the driving forces, etc. So that parts we looked at. Then we looked at LPCD, which is the liters per capita per day. So how much water is used by a person per day in a household. And um, we also went through different um, values and different um, volumes of water that has been promised, ranging from 40 to 70 NPCD in the rural regions. And for urban regions, we saw that it is 200 NPCD. So uh, we had a discussion on why uh, 40 to 60 NPCD has to be increased for better livelihood options, for better sanitation in rural regions. Because initially, there was no um, toilet facilities. But thanks to Swachh Bharat Mission and other missions by the government, uh, there is toilets. There is funds set up for toilets. But the water that is needed to clean the toilets and for the drainages is still needs to be accounted for. And that is where the LPCD rates may have to be pushed up. So the, the government norms we discussed by uh, 2030, by 2027, uh, uh, the government wants to push it to at least 70 LPCD. That will be enough water for people to avoid open defecation uh, and then use the latrines through the Swachh Bharat mission. So once we defined the course content, we understood why we need to study rural water resource management. Then we looked at the units and different parameters to calculate the volumes of water needed and water used. Then we went into the hydrological cycle. So even till the last lecture, we looked at how the hydrological cycle uh, is being spanned out. 
what are the key variables, what are the key drivers of hydrological cycle. We explain the fact that if the sun is not there, um, the hydrological cycle would stop and, and uh, it will stop evaporation, transpiration. So there won't be any complete, complete loop. So all these factors we looked into the hydrological cycle. So today uh, I would um, go from the atmosphere into precipitation sublimation. So the other aspects, because I want to close the hydrological cycle here. Uh, so some may, may be tell me, telling me that why I was not discussing uh, how the other parameters are important. So I'll go through some of the parameters that I skipped in the rural part because now we're going to close the hydrological cycle. So we have volcanic stream. Uh, so let's start with the atmosphere. Okay, so we have clouds. Uh, I'm going to follow through this arrow and then we'll go back. Okay, so we have clouds in the atmosphere, which is nothing but water vapor condensed water vapor and then after condensation it becomes precipitation. There are multiple types of precipitation. There is ice, snow and glacier deposits and there is rainfall. So there is thunders and rainfall you could see. So water comes down, condenses and comes down. Once it comes down there is some rivers and surface flow. Surface flow we looked at what constitutes surface flow, lakes, streams, rivers, etc. But there is also snow. And some of the snow can start to melt because of the sun. So the sun drives everything, as I said. So because of the sun's radiation and the warmth, some of the snow, which is deposited on the top of your uh, high altitude mountains, start to melt. And that water is called snow melt. So like your rainfall, which is your condensed water from clouds into precipitation and rain, you can have precipitation into snow and snow into water and that water also comes back to the river. So you can clearly see here that the snow which is uh, deposited on the top elevations are melted by the radiations and comes down as snow melt runoff. So this runoff and your rainfall runoff combine together in rivers and open water bodies. Then some of the water, let's say surface water goes into the soil. I told you in the previous example that part of the water gets captured by the trees, but then it goes down. And as soon as it hits the earth's surface, it converts to runoff, which is your uh, rivers, oceans, etc. But then also it has soil moisture. So it goes into the soil after plant uptake, etc. So uh, we, we felt this part, then let's come to this part. Okay, so some of the precipitation is also as permafrost and dew. Dew is a form of precipitation, very, very small droplets of water. Uh, and all of that can, and fog drip, et cetera, all of that can convert to surface runoff. So we are drawing a line here. All the parameters have been discussed. The sublimation and deposition is just conversion of, um, uh, water from one phase without going to going through a intermediate phase. For example, straight from snow, it can without converting into water, it can be evaporated. Okay, so same thing. What water, water vapor instead of coming back to liquid and then uh, freezing uh, to snow, you can also have sublimation and deposition. So that is what this cycle is. It's a very very small part, but still let's get through all the uh, important things. So we had this dew, sublimation, snow, permafrost, all of them convert to surface runoff and the surface runoff goes into rivers and lakes and oceans, surface discharge, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So once the water goes, gets into the river body and a stagnant water body, there's a lot of evaporation, again, driven by your sun. So it's because of the sun's heat and radiation, you do have a lot of evaporation. So water evaporates from the top surface. So from freshwater lakes, from oceans, you see these arrows, big, big arrows, showing that water is moving back into the atmosphere. So water started as a vapor, condensed into, condensed into clouds, then condensed into um, precipitation as liquid phase. And from the liquid phase, it goes back into vapor through the evaporation cycle. And then evaporation can cool down. Once the vapor cools down, it becomes clouds. Okay. So after the surface runoff and soil moisture, what happens? Some part, some part of water gets as seepage. 
and and once it seeps in infiltrates into the earth so this is where i said surface above and surface below so below the surface the water can infiltrate into the earth and come down as deep groundwater so this is the deep groundwater which is taking uh, sometimes millennia thousand years to reach to a point um, we will get through that when we discuss more on groundwater for rural regions but mostly uh, you see this cycle which is the shallow aquifer water infiltrates comes down into the ground and then seeps out some of the water can come out as seepage what is it called in indian terms it is springs so if you go to the himalayan regions or mountainous regions you see waterfalls springs which is suddenly uh, in a hill or a mountain you see water seeping out okay so that is seepage that is water which has gone into the ground and coming back out so that seepage can be a spring it can be a waterfall anything that comes out of the ground then some of the water can also get directly into the water body so we don't know how much this is because you cannot see it so when you see a river or a lake some of the water can also come from underground the lake okay so that part is your ground water uh, same how water can come uh, from the ground water to the lake part of the lake water can also get down into ground water so that is the ground water recharge and this is the ground water discharge all these arrows which are going from the ground water into the earth is called above the earth is called your discharge whereas here it is recharge it goes into the ground water this doesn't happen that quickly and easily so that is why we have wells we have wells and farmers put in pumps in rural villages to pull in the water out so as i say this a uh, particular phase this particular drivers are very limited as much as you have this one so recharge happens a lot this doesn't happen that much why because the groundward gravity force is there so water by default wants to move down only when there is a pressure difference there is some constrictions to flow it moves out like this okay mostly by pressure difference when the water is uh, water always moves from high potential to low potential so these are high potential energy going down to low potential energy and same thing high pressure to low pressure okay so when it finds a weak spot in the earth it breaks the part and then comes out and that is where you have springs waterfall etc etc you see water gushing out so when you see a waterfall it's not water coming slowly it's like gushing out with such a force and that is because of the pressure difference okay so as i said lot of recharge happens but not much of groundwater discharge and that is why people force it or or we force it by using pumps uh, industry or rural pumps for irrigation anything that pulls the water out against gravity and by spending a lot of energy okay so then groundwater also gets stored here which is the groundwater storage so there is a tank just imagine like a tank which is under the ground it stays there okay because there is a void there is a space water that takes long long time to get in would not easily come out okay so that is the groundwater storage there's deep and then uh, shallow groundwater storage and if you hit it right by the pump uh, and bore holes then you can take it out and that is what is happening in most villages okay so uh, you had all these precipitation converting into rivers and lakes and and discharge and then all of the water if you see goes back to the ocean be it ground water your river water your lake water so there's a very uh, philosophical saying of this too right all streams all water comes to one point so that is this point oceans so you it goes to the seas seas are smaller and oceans are big pacific ocean is big uh, arabian sea is small so it goes to the seas bay of bengal all of it and then goes back to the indian ocean for indian context i'm saying okay so ocean is the place where it finally ends all the water movement stops going into the earth side and then goes back up and that going back up is driven by your sun so as i said you have your sun and this cycle is not complete until it brings it back to the cloud so it need not be you don't have to start from the cloud you can even start from the ocean the same cycle will happen water converts from ocean to clouds clouds to rainfall rainfall to groundwater groundwater to fresh water fresh water to oceans so you could see here that the salinity is remaining back in the oceans it is the same water right 
the oceans have water plus salinity but when it evaporates and comes out as rainfall it is called fresh water which is it is not saline there is no salt in it you can you can uh, comparatively much 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 lower right and this is what they force it in a desalination plant they heat the water cool it down and then do all those things or remove the salt out so this is done naturally without any cost to the system by the sun but if you disrupt the system if you change any of these factors then nature gets violent that is what climate change is happening so if you change all these some of these parameters over evaporation then big big clouds come and uh, sudden condensation comes sudden convection comes so all these things happen when you disrupt these cycles in a particular fashion uh, that would be discussed more in a climate change kind of a lecture but here for rural water management please understand that it is not the different waters that are going back to the uh, atmosphere and oceans it is the same water what whatever water you don't hold it gets back to the oceans and from there it goes back into a cycle okay there are some water which gets stored in the ground water lakes rivers dams etc those are different but again it eventually evaporates or transpires so that part i missed so let's look at it here which is your plant and animal uptake even humans we transpire when we jog when we run we have sweat okay and then the sweat evaporates so there is a lot of transpiration when we say sweat it is transpiration i am transpiring that's what we say right so you have your plants your plants take up the water and transpire so all this transpiration would go back into your atmosphere and if it is just the uh, water bodies is called evaporation if it is with the plant it is called evapotranspiration so that's a big big factor look at the arrow size it is big the all the other arrows are smaller compared to uh, your up gradient of evaporation uh, and the evaporation from water bodies is also big the evaporation from smaller bodies is small uh, because the volume of water is small but oceans is really really big so that is why these big big arrows are coming we also discussed the localized need for hydrology in rural areas which is uh, understanding not all these parameters are important but very specific parameters for your research area and most of the time you will not have the hydrology of snow snow melt etc to discuss even the oceans you will not have it right you won't have a dam you will have a channel but not a dam so for rural water management you would be mostly looking into this part which is your weeds crop trees how much water they take how much water they transpire evaporate etc and the idea is this one how do you lessen how do you lessen or reduce the conversion of rainfall into runoff so that if you cut this uh, proportion of water you can save this water back into the cycle okay so understand that if you cut one of these the other uh, components can take the water up and use it for their respective purposes it gets divided uh, for other purposes Uh, i would like also to uh, stress the fact that for water management is really really necessary especially in nowadays where you have uh, climate change extremes of floods droughts etc so the composition might change drastically um, and availability of fresh water is decreasing day by day okay and for case of rural india we looked at of the total water uh, only 2.5% is fresh water and of the fresh water only 21% ground water 20 plus easily accessible water is 1% is available uh, and even that of all that only a part of the ground water you could use and um, what happens when there is no rainfall people go farmers go to ground water to recharge uh, or or irrigate their fields or they look at dams and channels not everywhere we have irrigation command areas but we do have wells almost everywhere in india uh, where you go and uh, take the water for irrigation even houses have ground water correct so understand that uh, we would be driving a more focus on water management how you can you conserve rainfall water and then uh, use it for agriculture but also we would be looking at this fresh water percentage the access is getting very difficult uh so that is why a lot of people are putting more money on the engineering aspect of pumping a uh, lot of water is being pumped uh, but again that is not sustainable as i showed in my hydrological cycle some of the groundwater takes thousands of years if not 100 years okay 
So most of the time you would see water recharging even across the boundaries of India that we are pulling now. So uh, that is how much uh, water uh, you may be using. We don't know. We don't know where the recharge is happening for some regions. Okay, it might be within the boundary of India, it may go out of the boundary of India. So it is very, very important to understand where the recharge is happening. And for that we need data which is really not available. So it is better to conserve the groundwater, use it wisely. Okay, just because you have water, don't just use it everything in one go. And that is for that, a clear understanding of the hydrological cycle is needed, where you use water is needed. Let's take a look at the freshwater stress as per uh, UN body. Uh, in 1995, we saw uh, uh, water withdrawal as percentage of total water available. For example, if I have 100 liters, what is the percentage, how much water am I taking out? So you could see that uh, in the world, uh, India was always taking more than 40% or around 40 to 20% of the total water. So you still saved around 60% um, of the water in 1995s. Okay? Uh, but then the case is slowly changing. The projections are really bad and it's saying that you're going to use more than 50 to 60 percent of your water. Okay, so uh, that is what the projections are given for 2025 and even the countries which are in green, which means which are using less than 10 percent of the water they used, they are converting into orange and yellow. The sad part here is you don't see anyone greening, which means you don't see from 1995 some countries which were in the yellows and greens um, um, or yellows and orange converting to green color, which is a safe color. You don't see that, right? So what is happening is all the countries are being increasing their water use or they are increasing the water withdrawal. And by that, they might be breaching how much water they could use. It may not affect the countries in green because uh, they just slightly increase, like for example, Canada, uh, of South America, you don't see how much water use Australia, etc. But if you come to the, uh, um, the Middle Eastern countries, India, China, you see uh, a lot of water being used and there is evidence of further increase of water use. Where is the water use? Now the first uh, image shows you that the water has been used a lot. Uh, let's see the evolution of global water use, withdrawal and consumption by sector. They are given only four sectors which is agriculture, domestic, which is drinking water and your water for ablution, bathing, et cetera. Industrial water for industries and reservoirs. Reservoirs is just a storage. You see that there's not much change you expect from 2000 to 2025 in reservoirs, which means the reservoirs, new reservoirs are not coming up. If you go and look at the news articles, you don't see any big dams being proposed. Maybe small dams a little bit, the height has been increased, uh, but the proposals are not as much as it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because people are slowly understanding that a centralized approach for water storage may not be the solution. So reservoirs are coming down and the forecast is also saying that it's, not, it's going to be stagnant. You're not going to increase it. But strikingly, you do see that the withdrawal, the withdrawal rate is going up, which is a dark green for agriculture, uh, exponentially high. Uh, but also the consumption is going up and the wastage, the wastage is the difference between how much water you take and how much you consume. So uh, the, the wastage is getting bigger and bigger. That is the concern. Initial days in 1900s, uh, we did not waste that much uh, because the withdrawal was less. The consumption was almost there. We knew how much water we, we would do. But now because of everyone having access to pumps, everyone having access to decentralized water supply, which is your groundwater, you are seeing a lot of wastage. Where water can be conserved, people may be using it for fa fallow irrigation, flood irrigation, rather than drip irrigation or other aspects. And that is what this graph is showing. The forecast is not looking good. The agricultural consumption is going high. The withdrawal is going high and the consumption is also going high, but the problem is between the withdrawal and the consumption, the wastage is going high. You also see that the withdrawal for uh, domestic use is going high uh, and the consumption is almost the same, 40 liters per day, 50 liters per day. Uh, so there's a lot of wastage. So a lot of wastage is happening. Industries, they do consume a lot, 
but they have the money and the technologies to conceive, conserve water. So some of them may be uh, putting in some systems to conserve water. So these volumes are all on the same scale. So you could clearly see that compared to uh, the water uh, availability and use, agriculture ranks the top, followed by domestic industry and reserves across the globe. Okay, so this is a study by the UN, and it clearly says that agriculture is where we first need to uh, rescue or conserve the water resources, uh, and then flow only to domestic industry and reservoirs. So this is why this course is very important. Uh, agriculture happens in rural India, and it is very important to go back to the roots and find where the water use is high, and is it is it is it possible to conserve the water? Because the farmers are still the same uh, stage, which is economic stage. It's not like they use a lot of water and they convert it to money, right? So where is the gap? Why are they not becoming rich? Why is the water being used at such an intensity? So that is what is very important for the future uh, generations. So this course would put you in track to understand where the withdrawals are high and how to conserve water. Therefore, there's a need to focus on rural water management. And again, I would like to propose that is the course, that is the uh, title of the course that you have signed up. So it is a very important study uh, area. And uh, to wrap up, uh, I will not get into the units again, but please have a book of uh, units. Uh, understand that because we were ruled by the British earlier stage, we still have a lot of English units. But because of the science uh, evolution and, and development, we do have metric units more. Okay. So metric units or SI units are centimeters, uh, square meter, kilometers, volume in liters, etc. cubic meters. But then you also switch back and forth in the English unit of inches, feet, uh, still cricket we use yards, right? And um, uh, you could also see uh, velocities in, in cubic feet per second in discharge uh, curves, etc., etc. Some properties are still okay. Globally, we are using the same terms like kilograms, grams, metric tons. Uh, all those things are okay, but somewhere we also switch back and forth to inches. So acres, for example, for, for agricultural area. Uh, so it is always important to understand the conversion rule. So easily you can have it on your mobile phones or you can have it, don't buy heart it, but have uh, it ready for uh, reading through, doing my exercises, etc. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude the first week of lectures. I hope you all enjoyed the uh, introduction to the course and why this course is very important. It is not a traditional course. Uh, it is going to be a sensitization course where you understand the need for rural water development uh, and hopefully understand where you could put your efforts in conserving water for India.